Hello and welcome to this glass tire check-in. So this is a series that we're doing during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, checking in with artists who are either based in Texas or have kind of a strong connection or a history with Texas. Um, this also, this check-in happens to be with the artist Kevin McMay Tweed, who is uh, in Glass Tire's upcoming auction that is going live later this week. So uh, joining us from Iowa City, uh, welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, I'm glad we could talk to you today. How are things in Iowa? Uh, pretty quiet. It's a college town, so it emptied out and um you know i think it's about like everywhere maybe iowa has a has a governor that didn't close anything um so there's college kids partying in groups but apart from that things are pretty sleepy you know you know like normally that would just kind of be another another saturday and now it's like this weird part of our life where we notice things like that right yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, so we're not here to talk about college kids partying. Um, so right now you're in Iowa, but for a long time you were um, in Austin. You are an artist, obviously, but you were also working at the nonprofit Big Medium. Can you talk a little bit about your time and your history and your relationship with Texas? Yeah. Um, I think it's one of those sort of Austin stories that has become really familiar, uh, which starts under fuzzy circumstances, and then somehow you sort of spent seven years there kind of thing. Um, that sounds about right. That sounds like a lot of places in Texas where you just kind of end up there and then all of a sudden so much time has passed. True, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I found it a really sort of hospitable place, um, like in a lot of ways culturally as well as like Barton Springs makes, makes Texas a livable place, you know, in the summer. Um, and then there's the whole sort of, what do they, what do they call it? The, uh, the like, it's, you know, there's like this joke about how it's an ideal place for like a lazy young person um, to retire in, in lavish circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I found it like, a pretty pretty great place for a, a rather aimless young person that just really wanted to not have a job and um, mm -hmm. like like many of us we've figured out that art is one of the few ways to um, sort of have control of your daily life and your existence and live a bit outside of um, job land. At least and, a little bit of like the illusion of control. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and then at some point I found, uh, I found like after like falling into making, making work really intensely, I, I started finding like the arts community in Austin, which um, was really exciting and sort of changed my life basically. And I um, started making stuff and then started working with Big Medium and then just doing like really, um, you know, lackey kind of shit, just like moving trash from one place to another or, um, editing things on the computer, entering uh, spreadsheets, uh, doing everything, like all nonprofits, you know, 25 different hats basically. And my, mm -hmm. my hats grew. And then at some point I was mostly focused on curating and um, I learned a lot from that. Um, mostly well, it, just being an idiot and not knowing, I learned the hard way in many, many ways. Um, so I got to work with tons of artists, hundreds of artists, and uh, that sort of just nourished my own my own studio, my own practice. Like, um, and, and I sort of figured out how to be a professional as well as like a maniac that doesn't want to have to 
operate outside of just the sort of modes of, of creative production? I feel like to be a successful artist, you have to be a little crazy, but you have to be able to operate in that too. So I, I guess you were kind of able to learn the operation mode in addition to just having the inherent crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that when I, when I joined big medium, the stakes were really quite low. Um, and it was growing like Austin seems like it always, the, the story always goes uh, it, it was growing really fast. So I sort of got in at this place where, um, our visibility was like quite big, but it was a teensy operation and, um, meaning there's few people doing many things and, um, yeah, so I kind of was there for this crazy ride of growth. And um, then it turns out that um, that job was indeed, after all, a job, um, <laughs> which is in some sense like incompatible with uh, many things that seem really quite important to me. So, mm -hmm. well, yeah. I mean, one of the things is that that job and your time in Austin as a whole, because it was such a significant portion of your life, it really kind of saw a significant progression in your work. I feel like I, you know, you and I have kind of known each other for a while at this point. The very first time I uh, went to Austin on Glass Tar's behalf, whenever I was walking around town, everyone was like, you have to meet Kevin, you have to meet Kevin. And that's the, like, the only thing that I heard over and over and over. Um, and I don't, I don't know <laughs> but because of that I started following your work and started like looking at the stuff that you had done before and it's kind of you've retained this really kind of nice and fun humor and absurdity and like jokiness in your work and I've seen that come out in a bunch of different forms in a way that's um really I mean, really rewarding to see. I, I love humorous art and I, it, humorous art is just kind of, it's a little self-conscious, but it's also just unabashed and reveling in its own mm -hmm. humor. Um, and I feel like a lot of art doesn't really touch on that, but I've seen that start out in one way and just kind of morph into different strains within your work, whether it's your, sure. um, your fake book covers or your drawings on rocks or even now the most recent thing that you've been doing a lot of your ceramics mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think um i think it's been sort of like i think it i think the the sort of presence of humor or whatever you want to call it in my work has been just like a thing i i have no control over i think it's just this sort of necessary part of uh existing having to exist um and figuring out how how funny things uh or like sublimely stupid things can um not like crowd out um other things that i care about and need to exist like sincerity and romance and um tenderness and you know loving plants and trees and shit like that. Um, so it's kind of been, um, I sort of fall into some mode of working that's kind of dictated by some material that I'm sort of experimenting with. And then um, quite often there's some balancing act of how do I sort of navigate um, these, these themes like, um, that I that I want to sort of hold and look at, which are funny things and beautiful things and sad things and uh, confusing things and yeah, mm -hmm. I think I, th I think it has been in my work a lot, yeah. And sometimes well, I, I move away from it and then I go back and I look at it and I I think oh this is actually just the same sort of thing. I think you're right, yeah. Well, even like the technique that you. Um, we're using because I right before you uh, left Austin, you had a show at the Museum of Human Achievement that was a ton of um, monoprints, but it's monoprints that were done in very much, I mean, they look like drawings. If you kind of yeah. didn't know any better, you'd think they were like colored pencil line drawings almost. Um, 
and when you first started making some of the ceramics that you started making once you went to Iowa, I know I kind of just glancing at them, like I wouldn't have recognized that they weren't just those monoprints again. Um, or different images, of course, but that it wasn't that style. Yeah. Because they're so, they're so visually similar and it, it just, it makes sense. Like you have a really interesting, particular like visual vocabulary that you just yeah. kind of draw back on. I don't want to get too academic about it, but like it's, it's, it's you. And after knowing you for so long and kind of seeing that pop up in different ways in your work, it's the same thing again, just like strained and tweaked again. Yeah. 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 I mean, I feel like it's like, I feel like it's it's kind of just this constant thing. Um, somehow I haven't gotten bored of just trying to make an image that I want to look at, that I like, that communicates, that does something, um, mm -hmm. or that freezes something. And it's it turns out it's really fucking hard, you know, to make something that um, can exist um, and be like self-possessed and communicate for itself without without me and um, have its own suggested history and um, yeah so and then I think like I think I uh, I think I, th I think you're right I think things end up there is some sort of continuity which is weird because like I th I feel like I try. Um, stylistically to go anywhere go everywhere and thematically i try to go everywhere and i think there's something that just some filter that happens that just uh yeah fits them into this recognizable thing sometimes mm -hmm. well I, I feel like a lot of times you come back to things that are kind of symbolically evocative in a really yeah. weird and interesting way like i mean for a while I've kind of seen you come in and out of it, but it was like, it was candles, like a lit burning candle. And I've seen that in, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've seen that in, I know in paintings, in drawings and ceramic, it's just everywhere and it spans like the yeah. last five, seven years. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I think I like, something I like to do for sure is I like to mine uh, like cliche, you know, and um, like, I like to mine like corny uh mainstream uh thing ma like vi visual culture visual history that's like seems like the book's closed on and seems like abundantly legible already mm -hmm. um and then it turns out like when I try it, it turns out that you you try and do something and then you try and make something and it it never it, it always sort of like uh something ex exerts itself and you have to listen to that and try and like uh codify that and then that history somehow absorbs the, the thing but there's some dissonance and, or um yeah yeah it's hard to it's hard to yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, it, I mean, it's hard to put into words because it is about, it's about the image and it's about the evocativeness of what you're doing with right. it. it is. And more importantly, it's like, it's about the repetition of it in yeah. a way. Like, I feel like with a few of your pieces, to understand the piece, you need to understand your own work, like the history of your own work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to ask you about the the two pieces that are in uh, the auction that's going live this weekend. Um, those are, I feel like, newer images to me that I haven't been as familiar with or newer scenes that I haven't seen as much of in your work. Would you tell us about them and tell us kind of what brought you to them? Um, I'm looking at them now. I'm looking at this flower piece. Um... I think most things start with me trying to uh, figure out how to draw something. Like I was trying to figure out how to draw um, these figures walking in a line or something and, some, and, and trying to like get some rhythm about that. And then um, 
it occurred to me that they need to be holding something or they can be holding something. And um, I, I don't know, I guess a flower, <laughs> flowers are easy, you know? It's like, it's that simple, it's that stupid. It's like, try and draw something and then you realize that there's uh, a need for something more either compositionally or like trying to like just uh create more drama you know movement on the on the composition or yeah. rhythm or just like uh drama you know like the the dramatic quotient has to be at the right place um so you just add things or remove things until that happens um and then after the fact after i made this this one um i was walking with my partner and the dog and looked at these tulips that uh, are right by our house. And I thought about the one, I brought her one one night, mm -hmm. this, uh, this red tulip. And when we walked that night, I looked at the patch of where the tulips were and I felt like they were staring at me, like asking, where's the other tulip? Um, and I just felt, horrible i just felt so strange uh and like seen through um and i i realized then that this piece is sort of about about that or something you know maybe mm -hmm. um, and then the second piece is uh these these tadpoles i think which are just disgusting grotesque <laughs> beautiful beautiful things that nature does uh so I think I, yeah, I don't know. I think I must have seen a, um, like some diagram of a, of a frog's growth from a tadpole and found it um, incredible and disgusting and beautiful. And um, I, love, I love seeing like diagrams like that where there's some drawing, there's some image making happening that has nothing to do with this thing that we're in the context of now, art. Mm -hmm. um, it's just about communicating effectively and simply and um uh articulately visually you know um so i learned from that kind of shit a lot and i and basically a lot of the time when i start drawing i'm just like in that kind of space of of learning trying to like figure out like how do you draw a frog that's halfway between tadpole and frog um so i think that's what that one is and then uh, experimentation with these glazes that um, yeah they have a super like funky pastel quality to them another thing that's I feel really kind of unique to you and your work is I can look at your work and I know it's your coloration like a lot of your paintings used like pretty raw pigment on unprimed canvas um, like a lot of uh, like the pieces right behind you are all your work and yeah. that's kind of what I think of you with your with your coloration and I see I see that come over to the ceramics but I see the the color kind of adapt based on how you're trying to figure out glazes and make glazes into your own colors yeah yeah it's it's impossible it's so so <laughs> so challenging um like a good example of that for example, is that in these two pieces, um, the perimeter of the one with the frogs is this black, this sort of matte black that's got a, got a lot of sort of richness and, and depth. And um, there's like some greens in there and then it gets white at certain points when it crusts up and the heat gets too hot for the thickness of it. And then the background of the flower piece is actually the exact same glaze. And uh, that happened to that one, you know, and it's like not black. Uh, it's, it shows brush strokes. It's extremely translucent. It's even glossy in some places. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I mean, I've used that glaze like a hundred times and it still does shit that I can't uh, predict or control, um, which is, you know, one of the marvelous things about working in ceramics now is that the mistakes of which there are so many are at least like uh -huh. really compelling, you know? Um, so like these smeary things at the background of the flower one, I love that. It's like this ethereal atmospheric sort of space, 
Um, I feel like it, ceramics are kind of the, the first time, or not the first time, but maybe the most that I've seen you have to adapt to a material. Yeah. Because a, a lot of time I feel like I really see you make the material adapt to what you're doing. Yeah. But yeah. I see a lot more kind of your own learning and having to deal with yeah. stuff happening in these ceramics. Yeah, well, there are many, many, many more variables. That's mm -hmm. true. I mean, I feel like everything I've gone, I feel like my work can be sort of broken down into bodies of work based on medium, you know? That seems like pretty clear. So yeah. like the, the, the paintings that are on raw canvas, and then there's the monotype series and then um and i and i think like like the monotype series and painting too for that matter was me learning how do i even how do i even make a mark that does what i wanted to do at all how do i have any control on this um like i didn't know i i still don't know how to oil paint i have never oil painted um and it took like with the, the work on canvas, I just like luckily found a single brush that was a dollar and 65 cents that allowed me to get the right kind of weight to the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just like guarded that with my life for years while I was making those sort of landscape paintings. Um, and then with this, um, I think it's like there's some something I like about it is there's there's there are so many variables and what happens in a kiln is just like completely out of our control. So, mm -hmm. so bizarre. So beyond uh, any sort of mastery or expertise so often at least um, that there's like a humility about it. And there's, it, it remains sort of in the realm of like curiosity and like, uh, which I care much more about than control. You know, I, I'm, I'd much rather be surprised uh, and see something new that I have never seen before, then get the exact black that I wanted to. Sometimes it's totally fucking maddening when I try to make a, a night scene or something, for example, and it comes out like an afternoon scene. Um, but, you know, with ceramics in particular, you, you have to just kind of um, sit back and accept so many things. Um, yeah. So I know, I know you're still working on some stuff now, like these ceramics are actually pretty fresh and you're working on a lot more ceramics. How's, how's what you're doing right now? Has it changed a lot? Are you still kind of on the same path and schedule? How's everything affected with your work right now? Yeah, it's pretty much the same. Um, I, I have a kiln here at my house in my garage that may burn down the, the neighborhood um, and I have a bunch of vats of glazes that I luckily made right before all of this happened and I got locked out of my studio complex um, with, where I have access to like um, chemicals and materials to make stuff and um, and clay that I could have for free so now I have to now I've been just like buying uh, a bunch of different clays and experimenting. So things are basically the same and I accept some of the materials are changing and my house is becoming as messy as my studio. And I've seen your studio. That's actually kind of frightening. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you're me. Well, I keep one room closed basically. So the rest of the house, not that bad actually. <laughs> yeah that's, that's good <laughs> yeah, it is. well it's, it's also like a matter of of serious uh health issues you know clay ceramics are really yeah like glazes and the materials and the clay the dust particles are pretty fucking dangerous and bad for you so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's worse than just being messy you know the risks are higher that's that's very true <laughs> well I'm glad, I'm glad you're staying safe. Is there, before we, before we end up, is there any, so like, I know a lot of people are getting like super into a podcast, an author, like a show. Are you doing any deep dives right now or is it just kind of all art 24 um, seven? What am I reading? Um, 
I, I was just talking about this, um, how the way that I read these days is, or always actually, I've just kind of accepted it more lately, is I have like these like tectonic fucking plates of books piled by my bedside. And um, I read them all at once, basically, depending on the night. So sometimes I'll read a different book every night. Sometimes I'll read a the same book for five days or whatever but I almost never finish books uh, and I've at this point kind of just stopped trying to do that and stopped trying to even like differentiate between them and I, I sort of just go into them uh, seeking some sort of headspace or some sort of uh, some place that I can enact my own thoughts that I, some kind of mm -hmm. fucking feeling that I need to feel at that moment. I'm reading it, I'm reading it because I need to feel a certain way that I, I need some, I need something from it. Yeah. Uh, so I, sometimes I'll read Japanese aesthetic theory books. Sometimes I'll, in order to get into that space where I need something analytical. And then sometimes I'll just read some like, like short stories that are set in Paris or some shit because I need some, I need that kind of romance. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I kind of just, I don't differentiate at all between um, what I'm reading or the kinds of things I'm reading or the kinds of things I'm looking at. Certainly not in terms of like the hierarchies of context in which um, books or images exist. Like I'm looking at a, like a shell the shell logos, shell gas logos in the same way that I'm looking at uh, Bryce Martin monogram series, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's how I read and that's how I consume podcast TV, blah, blah, blah. I'm also always doing like 10 different things. So I'm like watching uh, some, some garbage on Netflix and also drawing at the same time and maybe flipping through a book. So it's impossible to tell. And maybe that looks, maybe that's obvious looking at my work now that I think about it. You know that, I was going to say, that makes a lot of sense. Um, at least to me. We'll see if it makes sense to anyone watching this. But. <laughs> well, fuck them. Who cares? Anyway. <laughs> Just kidding. Kevin. I hope it's all about enjoyment and, you know, keeping love at the center of things. So. Kevin, thanks for taking time to talk. Uh, yeah. Thank you for being in this year's Glass Tire auction and stay well. My pleasure. Thanks very much. I hope you guys all stay well as well. Thanks. Go look at art. Go look at art. <laughs>